Today on the John Ankerberg Show, there is a brand new museum opening in Washington, D.C., November 17th, called The Museum of the Bible. This book has impacted our world in every area of our lives, from science to government, to the economy, to education. It impacts our language. It impacts the way we view culture. It's the way that we lead families. It's affected more people throughout history. It's affected more governments. It's been banned the most. It's been burnt the most. It's been debated the most. Life magazine had the 100 most impactful events of a millennium. And number one was the Bible being printed on the Gutenberg Press. This book is the most incredible story that's ever been told. And so it needs to be shown and told in the most incredible way. So the Museum of the Bible is really three different pillars, research, education. And with the museum itself there in Washington, D.C., collectively that is what the Museum of the Bible is all about. It's much more than a museum of artifacts. It's technology, it's theatrical, it's the proven history and the ancient validation of this great book that are all there in one place. This book has an incredible story and our role is to bring that story alive. And so we are using some of the latest technologies to help do that. Our artifacts are amazing. It will blow your mind. To tell us about this new museum, my guests are Steve Green, president of the 750 Hobby Lobby stores in 47 states, and chairman of the Museum of the Bible. Second, his wife Jackie, who is co-founder of the museum, and for six years has worked with the development team of the museum. And third is Carrie Summers, president of the Museum of the Bible. Join us for this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg. Thanks for joining us today. We've got a great program for you. As you just heard, we've got three great guests. First is Steve Green, president of the Hobby Lobby stores and chairman of the Museum of the Bible. And second is his dear wife, Jackie, who is co-founder of the museum. And third is Carrie Summers, who is president of the Museum of the Bible. Folks, I'm glad that you're here today. And Steve, the main question always becomes this. Why did you think that America needed a non-sectarian museum of the Bible to be placed in Washington, D.C. for everybody to come to? Well, because of the book uh, and its impact on our world and even more specifically on our nation. Here, here's a book that is foundational to the principles our nation was built upon. And if we don't know this book, then uh, we are at risk of losing some of those foundational principles, potentially. And so uh, we just think that people ought to know this book. They can choose to do what they want to with it. But we just think that uh, pre presenting this book and the facts of this book, where it's not trying to push an agenda, a faith agenda, but just saying, understand this book and then let the visitor decide for themselves what they want to do with it uh, is what we wanted to do because we think that the book stands on its own. Uh, if people will give it an honest consideration, uh, we think that uh, it will inspire them to want to know it more and to engage with it. Yeah, when I first heard you speaking at one of the presentations, you had a great illustration that came right out of Life magazine. Tell us what that was. Well, Life Magazine in the year 2000 came out with a publication, The 100 Most Important Events and People of a Millennium. So for a thousand years, they were trying to determine what were the most impactful events. And when, they, when it came down to the top 10, the top 10 events uh, were, were the following. Number 10 was Compass Goes to Sea, Hitler Comes to Power. Now that's the one that makes me think that important may not be the best term but impactful may be a better term to say, yeah. because I wouldn't say that Hitler coming to power was important, but was it impactful? Yes, it impacted our world. Then Declaration of Independence, gunpowdered weapons, germ theory, Galileo's telescope, the Industrial Revolution, Luther Knox, Columbus's voyage. Those were nine of the top 10 events, and these things ought to be taught. The Holocaust ought to be taught in our schools because of its impact. Uh, Declaration of Independence, uh, Columbus's voyage. These things should be taught simply because of the impact, good or bad. But number one on that list was Gutenberg Prints the Bible. It wasn't the Gutenberg Press, it was Gutenberg Prints the Bible. That changed our world. And I don't think the average person has 
a full appreciation of the impact that this book has had on their lives. And we just think people ought to know that. And that's what you put into the museum. You put all the ways that the Bible has impacted not only our country, but the entire world, which is absolutely fascinating and it continues to do that. Carrie, last week we talked about two important floors. You come in the main entrance, you got the main floor. And we talked about the two floors below that. Today I want you to talk more about when they enter this museum, what are they going to see that they're going to say, wow, this is like nothing else in Washington. Yeah, it starts when they are just approaching the museum. Uh, they enter through two uh, 40 foot high bronze doors, total weight 16 tons, and that's the Gutenberg uh, press bed that was they were used to print on, and it's Genesis chapter one. Yeah, and, we're watching it right now as you talk. And then uh, there's a piece of glass that's facing them, and that's a uh, etched glass, 30 foot tall, etched in Germany. It's from the, what's called the Bobner Papyrus. It's the oldest known piece of the Septuagint, which is the, the Hebrew text translated into Greek. And this is Psalms 19. So it's a third century piece. And why'd you pick Psalm 19? Well, I'm gonna ask the audience to go back and read it. Yep. Uh, and it's, uh, it's really sort of our theme song, if, we, if you were to call it that. Uh, really dynamic. Uh, yep. And it, uh, it talks about really what, well, why we're doing this museum. And then once they're in, they get to see a, a gorgeous ceiling that's going to catch everybody by surprise. By the way, we've just seen it in operation now, and it caught all of us by surprise on how magnificent it is. 40 foot uh, in the air, 20 foot wide, and it changes by the minute, the second, the hour, however often we want to. And it deals with images of uh, biblical images, uh, medieval manuscript images, whatever image we want. And so when you, before you even uh, ask for, to get into the museum, uh, the process of that uh, approaching it is really something that very few people have ever seen. Talk about the children's area on the main floor. Yeah, the children's area is uh, really one of our favorites. It's one that we don't, you know, it, you, you get to speak about all these great artifacts. But the children's area is something that is uh, missing in a lot of museums because this is based upon biblical stories. So they get to play games in there, and a lot of them are, you know, throw the throw the sock and throw the bean bag and you know throw the ball and all those. But it also involves all biblical characters and scenes from the Bible. So it's not only fun; they can burn off energy, but they also can engage with uh, tablets in there. They have uh, stations where they can go on. Uh, online, so to speak, within our, you know, our context. And uh, they can take some of this home with them. So it doesn't just stop there. They can take some of these games home with them with the different apps that are available. Yeah, and then you've got to talk about how you've got the new technology that will guide people through the museum and form a course through the museum of anything that they're really interested in. Talk about this. Yeah, this is uh, something everybody gets, by the way. Uh, it's a volunteer donation to come into the museum. But everybody gets one of these, we call them electronic docents. It's a tablet-based uh, program that we've developed. Uh, right now we have four patent pending. So it's something that we saw a need in the museum world, especially big museums. Nobody was doing it and we simply hired the people that knew how to do it, put them on staff and they've created this. So it gives you an ability to key in how much time you have, what is your interest level, many other things that you may want to see, may not want to see. But most of the time we're finding people are saying, hey, I have interest and I'm going to pick on uh, Bible in America. I have uh, uh, two hours, I have one, my interest is Bible in America, lay something out for me and tell me how to go and how to get there. This machine then uh, does that. It knows where you are within four inches of everywhere you walk. It knows how long you're spending in front of different areas and it will talk to you. And it'll say, John, if you don't pick up your pace, you will never get finished with your tour that you've laid out. You can change the tour. You can follow other people in your group. You can make reservations, uh, different things in the museum. And so what it does, it takes a lot of the high frustration of big museums. And the content on there has five levels of learning. So these are all by high-end academics, and you can drill down as deep as you want on these tablets. All right, describe the gift shop area. I mean, this sounds funny to ask that question, but you have designed this gift shop in a special way. We have. Uh, we've researched uh, gift shops all over the country in museums and globally. 
And we found that the most of them have uh, the traditional trinkets, you might call, and those are great, and kids can have them and take something home with them. But we also found there was a high need, uh, especially th with our museum. We have over 100 academics who have worked on this museum with the content. Many of these are high-end academics, great, great authors, writers, but most people would never know how to ask who they are, or what, they, what they're writing about. So in our gift shop, it's a learning experience unto itself. It has replica things in the, in, that they're going to see in the museum, but also many of the uh, academics that have worked with us throughout this whole length of time, their books are going to be there. And also seminar material is there. Videos are available on the seminars that we have done. Over a hundred of those, they're available too. So it's not just the uh, pencils and pens and magnets, although we certainly will have those. It's a, it's a part of a, almost a museum experience in itself. Yeah. And Jackie, you have worked very hard on making sure that when children and young people come to this museum, that they come away having the Bible actually impacted their life so that they don't forget it. Describe uh, what will, will kids actually come away with in your estimation? What have you put in this museum that you think they're going to say, wow, and they'll never forget it? I think, um, you know, individually it could be in a lot of ways, depending on how old they are, you know, for the young ones to be ha able to interact on the children's floor or their area with to see um, how big Goliath is. You know, they've read about Goliath, heard the stories maybe. Uh, now they can see exactly how big he was compared to how, how big they are. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to throw the bean bags, to, to do the interacting of, of the biblical stories. But then they also can go through and see these ancient artifacts and see that they are valid and true and real and uh, it validates and makes the scriptures and the stories that they read at home come to life. And I love that they have the digital docents that they can carry around and have their questions answered on their academic level. I think it'll impact them forever. I think it's terrific. Carrie, let's talk about what is on floor two. This is the impact of the Bible on America and the impact of the Bible in the world. What did you put there? You know, we uh, we argue internally just which is the most popular floor, and uh, it's uh, op open for big discussion. We think maybe the impact floor may have the, the highest attendance because it's current today. It has two main areas, Bible in America and then Bible Global. And this is the impact of the Bible. Bible in America is sort of self-definitive. The Bible globally, what we're trying to show in 30 different exhibits is that the Bible is all around you. And you, and you didn't even know. But Bible in America is uh, going to be one of the hot spots in the museum. And the hot spot is, uh, and through research we have found, that foreign visitors to the U.S. really want to understand the story of democracy and a, and, a, and a nation that was founded upon biblical principles. And that's what they're going to see in Bible in America. All right. Steve, I want to talk about this impact floor. First of all, it's an interesting name, Impact Floor. What is the purpose of this floor in your heart? What did you want to create? Well, this book speaks into every area of life and it has impacted every area of life. Uh, the average person really does not fully understand to the degree that this book has had an impact on their life. Uh, so what we were wanting to do is we wanted just to show that. Um, we have a large section that just talks about the Bible's influence in America. Here is a nation uh, that has been built uh, the effort has been to build this nation on principles found in this Bible. Uh, it's never been perfect and it never will be, but that is the uh, effort that our founders had. And uh, th the idea that all men are created equal, where did that concept come from? Uh, it is a biblical concept. That is what was the influence. They generally had a biblical worldview and we can discuss their beliefs and, and they, they're different. But for the most part, it was this book that had that influence. So we have a large section that shows that. Uh, but then we also get to a point where it, it shares even at an individual life. Uh, there are stories that will be shared of how that this book has impacted an individual person's life. So everything from one of the most powerful nations on earth to individual life and everything in between, we wanted the, uh, a person to realize that this book has had an impact on our world and it has impacted their life in every area of life. Yeah, and Carrie, what are some of the items that you think people are just gonna wanna see 
that you've placed in this museum on the impact floor, impact of the world, impact on America. Impact America has, uh, it's not only a wonderful visual view there, but it also has many, many artifacts. Uh, the Aiken Bible, which is the only authorized Bible that's ever been authorized by the U.S. government, to be printed by the U.S. government. We have the uh, famous Thomas Jefferson letter, which uh, what he wrote to a friend, and it, it said that uh, no provision in our Constitution ought to be dearer to man than that which protects the rights of the conscious against the enterprise of civil authority. Uh, very timely even today, that yeah, letter. Now, tell how that came to you. <laughs> well, it's a very a fascinating story. Uh, Rick Warren, uh, most people recognize the name, uh, had, had that letter, and um, on, a, on a trip uh, Steve was on, uh, he was on a plane and Rick Warren called and said, Steve, I've got this uh, letter uh, from Thomas Jefferson. I bought it, but I think it really should be in the museum of the Bible because that's, that's where it comes And that to spoke it. to you because you were right in the middle of the Supreme Court case. It did. Um, what, what had happened is I was at a conference where Rick Warren was speaking and he, uh, in, in his uh, lecture, pulled out a copy of this letter that he owned <laughs> and he quotes that line that uh, uh, Carrie mentioned. And so, um, I, when he came back to the seat, I said, could I get a copy of that? And he pulled it out and gave it to me. And uh, we actually were in D.C. meeting with uh, a senator and, and uh, they were interested. We were sharing about the Bible Museum. He was interested in about the court case because we were in the middle of the court case. And he started paraphrasing that line from this letter, which I just happened to have brought the copy. And I bring it out and says, well, here's a copy of that letter and uh, was able to share it with it. And it was on that flight home from that visit to D.C. that uh, I get word from Rick Warren that he was interested in selling it. He was raising funds for another mission effort and wanted to offer to us first. And uh, we gladly said we would love to have that letter. Yeah, and Carrie, you have something for the Jewish people. You have something for the African-American community. You've got all kinds of things in this museum. Talk yes, about that. we brought in top scholars in the Jewish community, the African-American community, uh, the Catholic community, the Protestant community, to be able to tell the story of Bible in America, the Founding Fathers uh, story also. But uh, the, the African-American, the Jewish, and some of the others were really has sort of been skipped over. And uh, we thought it was uh, appropriate and right to tell those stories. So that will also be in the Bible in America. You'll also learn about the impact of the Bible on languages, on art, fashion, and even you picked up something in 2014. You went to a, a fashion show in New York City. Talk about what you saw there and you bought the whole thing. Yeah, the reason that we even did Impact of the Bible globally is that we want to show people that the Bible's all around you. And now many would acknowledge there and nod to that comment. But we said, let's show some things that people may not realize how around it is. And one of them happened to be uh, in New York City in 2014, the, there's a couple of couture fashion shows. And one of them in particular had uh, Bible's impact uh, on fashion and jewelry. And it was just terrific. And uh, we said, wow, now that one caught us off guard. And we said, let's just do that. So we, we bought the collection and interviewed the designers, which we'll have in the museum, and it shows that the Bible really is impacting more than you and I could even think about. And that's what the majority of these exhibits are on that section. Jackie, I would assume that you think all the women are going to want to see that little section. Absolutely. Uh, women were drawn typically to fashion more probably than you guys are. Mm -hmm. And I am sporting a silk scarf that uh, we had replicated from one of our it's a German Psalter uh, in our collection, and you know it's beautiful. I think the motifs and illustrations from biblical artifacts are used around us all the time, and we don't recognize them within fashion and jewelry. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, let's go back to the founding fathers for a moment. You didn't just put the Thomas Jefferson letter up. You've got a whole host of original documents from the founding fathers. And what do they tell people? Yeah, this is uh, housed in this uh, almost spaghetti box looking uh, long room. It has a 254 foot uh, woven scrim. That's the longest ever been done in the U.S. And it tells the story there. But it's also uh, from, the, from various foundation elements. Um, uh, Judy Howe Ward wrote the words that we now call the Battle Hymn of the Republic at two o'clock in the morning at the Willard Hotel. And it was given to Lincoln. And it, it, as most uh, historians will say, it, it changed the course of war. And uh, we own that letter, uh, that notes that she took. Uh, we have Founding Fathers letters that were communications between themselves. And then we had Abraham Lincoln's collection on letters back and forth. And through all of this, it's not just a item. 
but it, it through this massive collection that we put together, you, it weaves a tapestry that says, here, here was this, the thoughts of the day. Here's what things were going on. This is what they were thinking and talking to each other about. And voila, here's what the, the product was that we call the documents of our foundation. Yeah, now, where did you guys get the idea that you wanted to actually purchase a Liberty Bell, okay? <laughs> And you've already got this in the museum, but talk about how big this thing is. Well, the Liberty Bell is a donation. It was donated to us by a person. It's the same, uh, came from the same foundry as the one in Philadelphia and the molds. And uh, somebody said, well, is it a replica? Well, it's, it's hard to say. It's certainly a, different from the one in Philadelphia, but the same, same factory. And it's so heavy and so big, we had to have it lowered in by a crane into the second level before the walls ever went up, the roof ever went up, because it had to come in and we had to pick the exact spot because it wasn't gonna move. <laughs> and uh, so where it is is where it is. All right. Also, if the number one event in the last thousand years was the printing of the Bible by the Gutenberg Press, you actually put an actual working Gutenberg Press and you're gonna actually press out some sheets that people can see. You'll have somebody actually doing the printing there all the time. Yes, the, the printer who will be Gutenberg per se, that'll explain the history of the Gutenberg press. And also we have original Gutenberg first edition pages that are being a case, but they can see the process and learn why this was such a difficult process. So we think the Gutenberg Press was something, you know, very simple to use. It was not. It was difficult unto itself. And to realize that it changed the course of history because what he produced first was the Bible, and that's another story unto, unto itself. Yeah. You've also got a spot that you liken to Times Square. Talk about uh, what you've done where people can put their input in. You can ask questions across the world and it's gonna appear right there. You're gonna see impact from all over the world coming at the same time. It's kind of explain that. Yeah, this is, uh, if, if there's one area in the museum where we're saying, well, where's the people are gonna hang out? This is it. It's a gigantic room, circular in nature, and uh, there's two key elements in there. One is in cooperation with Uversion, which is uh, an app that you can put on your, your cell phone, your data phone. The time we open, it will have over 300 million users. And in partnering with them, we're able to ask questions of the world. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And also, it shows where downloads are coming by the second, all throughout the world. And the other part of that room is that the system then uh, scrapes, is the term that's used, globally anything that deals with the Bible. And there's a hundred different places it pops up in this room and you can see what's happening today in any country in the world dealing with the Bible. So it's, it's almost like a newsroom uh, and this gigantic screen that allows us to communicate with the world to really form a community of interested people, and this room is sort of the hub of it. All right, folks, you just heard a little bit about what's going in this new Museum of the Bible opening up November the 17th. And next week, I want Steve and uh, Jackie and Carrie to talk about the next floor, which is the narrative floor, because as they did research, people all have a Bible on their shelf at home. Some have two, some have three, right across America, but they don't know the stories. They don't know the narrative of the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament. And they've got a section for the Old Testament and for the New Testament, and it is fantastic, okay? It's gonna be one of the things you've got to see, and we're gonna describe what is in there next week, so I hope that you'll join us then. Folks, I think that all of us as Christians are proud that we're gonna have a major museum in Washington, D.C. that honors the Bible. And people coming from around the world, as they step inside the museum, they're going to see a million name wall listing those who say, I too honor the Bible and support this museum. If you'll give a generous gift of any amount, the museum will engrave and display your name on their million name wall for all to see. To have your name permanently engraved on this wall, just go to the museumofthebible.org slash million names wall. Then, can I remind you to pray for the Christians in Russia? In the last few weeks, the Russian government has harshly cracked down on the evangelical Christian churches. I just talked with Hanu Hauka in Finland, and the situation is getting worse. Listen. 
Well, John, the Russian government is doing everything to make it impossible for the evangelical churches in Russia to continue to minister and to preach the gospel. Uh, we have received reports of uh, baptismal services being broken up. We have reports of, of 74 pastors that have already been charged under a new terrorism law. And the Russian government has cracked down on all of the evangelical churches with new laws and restrictive regulations that have been added to the law that was signed by President Putin last year. Further, the Russian government is requiring anyone who leads in a church in any way, such as Sunday school teachers or youth pastors, they are required to go through a government training program to receive a special government certificate in order to continue teaching. The problem is that the government has their own curriculum. Will these Christians uh, accept what the government is telling them what to teach in their own churches? If they don't, then the government says they will not be allowed to teach or have ministry in their own church. Uh, John, I have received an urgent request from 1,600 evangelical churches in Russia for one million power to change books. These books were primary tools for leading hundreds of thousands of people to a personal faith in Jesus Christ. As a result, over 2,000 new churches were planted between 2013 and 2016. Now the need for more books is even greater. While the Russian authorities are closing the door on evangelism big time, God has providentially and seemingly miraculously allowed printing presses in Russia to print these books for us. But this opportunity will soon be gone. So I urge you, and I ask for your help right away to provide one million power to change books, high impact tools for evangelism before the doors in Russia close for good. Now folks, we're trying to provide these one million power to change books for Christians in Russia. And we've already received gifts to provide over 510,000 books, but we need to do more. If you'll help us today, there are five ways you can provide these books and help our ministry's outreach. First, if you'll give a gift of just $30, your gift will provide 45 books. Second, your gift of $100 will provide 150 books. Your gift of $500 will provide 750 books. And a gift of $1,000 will provide 1,500 books. Your gift of $5,000 will provide 7,500 books. And if you're able, a gift of $50,000 will provide 75,000 books. These dear Christians in Russia need our help now before the doors close for good. And if you'll help, please call us right now at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. You may call the same number any day this week, 24 hours a day, or you may go to our website at jashow.org where we have a secure place for you to give your gift. Folks, I'll appreciate your help very much.